morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Woo! Paul, I'm glad you're doing great, and somebody over there's great. I'm great. My name is Brandon. I'm the associate minister here at Swiss Cove Christian Church, and I want to welcome all our students into the room. It is Family Sunday. We've got preschoolers, elementary kids with us, and we're so glad to have you guys here uh, don't forget, you have a card. You get to turn that in later. Yes, Paul, you're an elementary student. Uh, you know, if you have your little piece of paper, make sure you turn that in with Miss Megan at the end of service, and she has something for you. I have no idea what it is, uh, but she'll take care of that. But kids, I have to let you guys in on a little information that the adults already know. I told them this a couple weeks ago about myself, but I want you guys to know that I'm a very pessimistic person. And so what that means is that I constantly lean toward the negative. I'm thinking worst case scenario. I'm always wondering what's going to go wrong. Who's going to mess up? Am I going to mess up? Is it my fault? Is it their fault? I'm just always thinking that something is going to happen the wrong way. And so what that means is that I fear life a lot. I just have a general fear when I'm going about things. And fear leads to a word that we're talking about today. And that word is doubt. Doubt is a word uh, that I'm really good at. I'm really good at doubting things. Uh, I tend to lean toward the negative. I tend to doubt myself. I tend to doubt others. And I want to tell you guys about a time when I doubted somebody very important to me that I absolutely should not have doubted. And this story starts with my love of dogs. Many of you know that I have a deep love and obsession and affection for dogs. Where are all my dog people in the room? Yeah, raise your hand if you're a dog person. All right, the Christians, great. Uh, Everybody else, I'm sorry, you can leave. No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Um, Though I do think Jesus was a dog person. We can argue about that later. I have no scriptural evidence for it other than I'm a dog person, but we'll talk about that later. Um, So yes, I'm a dog person. I've got three dogs. I got in trouble in first service because I didn't say their names. It's Bandit, Java, and Nala. Um, And if you've ever heard me talk about my dogs, I like one of them a lot more than I like the rest. I favor one dog by a lot. And when I say a lot, I mean a whole lot. My wife is like a don't play favorites kind of person. You know, if you give one dog table food, you have to give all the dogs table food. Uh, If one dog's on the couch, they all get to be on the couch. And I'm a be a cooler dog and you might get better things kind of person. Uh, So my favorite dog gets all the table food. And my favorite dog is always on the couch with me. Um, And so I definitely play favorites with the dogs. Um, And here's where the doubt came in. My favorite dog, uh, her name is Nala. She's a Disney princess, right? Um, And I didn't want her. When we went to get her, I, I, I didn't want her. I mean, I wanted her. Me and my wife had been talking about getting a dog. I would buy every dog in the world if I could and spoil them rotten. But, but we had just gotten married and we were walking around. We kind of had talked about wanting a dog. But we walk in, we see this cute thing. We're encapsulated by its cuteness. It's running around. We do the thing where you see it and pet it. And we sat there for like two hours with this dog. And at the very end, I'm like, not right now. It's just not the right time. And I ended up saying no. My wife said we needed the dog I said, we don't need another dog. We already had two. So fast forward a little bit. It's three days later, and we're walking around, and me and my geniusness is just like, man, that dog was cute, which was the wrong thing to say. Um, And so needless to say, we ended up the next day back sitting in front of Nala and, and picking her up. And I remember taking her home that night, and she's running around looking, you know, doing the little puppy thing where she puts her paws up on everything and is doing just all kinds of cute stuff. She's never seen a toy before. It feels like she's chasing tennis ball around. And I'm just sitting back going, man, did I just make the biggest mistake of my life? I did not want this dog. So fast forward till now. Nala is m- my favorite dog in the world, our, our best dog. Uh, me and Nala are in what's called the Best Friends Club. There's only two people allowed in the club. It's me and it's Nala. Uh, nobody else is allowed in. We do everything together. She's always on my lap. She's always following me around. I bring her to youth group sometimes. The kids all in, in Cove students know her very well um, because I absolutely adore this dog. And I should have never doubted the person who told me we were going to get it because we talked about it for so long. We had been talking about getting this dog for two years, but... I was raised where I was always told that if I wanted something done right, I should do it myself. I was always leaning toward the negative. I'd been let down plenty of times, so if I wasn't making the decision, I tended to sit back and go, well, maybe this isn't the right decision. 
I like to work independently. I, I, I strive to kind of isolate. I don't like to rely on others. And that's what a lot of life does to us, isn't it? It puts us in a position where we rely on ourselves rather than on earth, others. We experience something bad somewhere along the line, and we have fear from that bad thing, and that fear leads to doubt. And any time you're put in any similar situation, we doubt what's going to happen because of past hurts. And I'm the person that leans toward doubt. And as I wrote this, I began realizing just how big of a word doubt is. I mean, obviously, it's not a big word. It's not a million-dollar word. It's barely a $100,000 word. It's only five letters long. But the word doubt carries an insane amount of meaning. It's, it's loaded. It's layered. Because if I asked you, if I said, hey, why do you doubt this person? Man, there's a story attached to that. There's pain attached to that. There's an experience attached to that. It's never just, eh, because. It's always, there's always more to the story. And people have a, I'm going to call it talent, of making really big things out of really small things. And we do this with our doubts. And now let's start to roll over that to our relationship with God. Because when we doubt God, it's not about the simple stuff. It's not about the little questions. It's the big ones. The ones that can sometimes be hard to answer, right? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why did someone die young? Why does this kid in my elementary school have cancer? Why'd the nicest person marry the abusive spouse? And we wonder, why did God let that happen? Sometimes we wonder things and we doubt, it, is the Bible real? And we read stories in Second Kings and we're like, man, did a bear actually maul 42 children because of a curse that a prophet put on him? Or did a bear maul 42 children and the prophet took credit for it? Did the walls of Jericho actually fall the way Scripture says it does? Or is it religious embellishment? Or a very specific doubt that we're going to be talking about today, which is, did Jesus really rise from the grave? Is Jesus still alive? Because I think at some point or another, we've all asked that question. Did this really happen? Is what we worship, is what we do, is it really real? And thankfully, we're not the only ones that have asked that question before. Uh, in our series overheard where we're looking at conversations with Jesus. We actually get to hear a conversation where Jesus addresses this head on in John chapter 20, starting in verse 9, 13, 19. So if you want to open up your Bibles to John chapter 20, verse 19, uh, we're going to find a story that I find as one of the more relatable stories in scripture. Uh, and we're looking at a guy named Thomas, and we've labeled him Doubting Thomas because that's what he does, is he he doubts. He has a doubt, and so we've labeled him with this big, ugly word of doubt. And I think as we read this story, a story we normally glance over, we're going to see one of the most human elements any of us have all experienced in our life. So let's dive into John chapter 20. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, so the disciples are hiding in a room or in a house, and they have the doors locked because they are being hunted. They are being looked to be arrested, sometimes killed. So they are afraid. And Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side so they could see the holes where he had been crucified. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So we have the disciples here. They're locked behind closed doors. And they're locked behind closed doors because of fear, afraid of being killed, afraid of being found. Um, they had the option when Jesus died to return to their normal lifestyles. All they had to do was be like, uh, yeah, this wasn't real. The guy wasn't who he said he was. And everybody in the world would have let them go back to a normal way of life. But they did the incredibly admirable thing, which was stick to the truth. And they knew that Jesus had risen from the dead. So they kept pursuing that. But there was someone missing. And his name was Thomas. Thomas wasn't with the disciples the first time that Jesus appeared to them. He was separated. It says, now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And to me, 
this verse doesn't look like a whole lot, but it's one of the most human verses in Scripture because we're going to learn in a little bit why Thomas is not with, with the twelve. And it's because he didn't believe. He literally went through life, saw what happened, saw Jesus crucified, and he thought Jesus was dead, and that was the end of it. He thought that the whole thing was a sham, that it was over. He, he'd spent three years learning, following, devoting his life to Jesus, and when he saw Jesus die, he thought he had wasted his time. He thought it was over. He had probably gone back to his normal lifestyle. He had probably gone back to his past. He was out walking around. And I don't know about you, but this is the most human reaction I've ever seen in life. When we do something hard and we're pushing through and we don't quite get to the end and we feel it all fall down and we just return to our normal way of life. He didn't believe. He didn't believe. And I can hear this next part of the conversation happen because I've had it with so many people about different things, but not about Jesus. So the other disciples told him, notice, They weren't together, now they're together. The disciples went and found Thomas. We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, this is Thomas, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands in his side, I will not believe. Thomas is out on the whole Jesus thing. So a week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Man, those are good friends. Because even in his doubt, even in his unbelief, his friends went and got him and made sure he was still included with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, he zeroes in. And we get one of the shortest conversations in this series. Put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out with your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Now Jesus wasn't physically with the disciples when they first went to Thomas and he said, yo, I need to touch him. I need to put my hands where, where the nail marks were. I need to feel his side. But look what Jesus does is he knows that conversation and he meets him right where he was. And then Thomas said to the Lord, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus said, because you have seen, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. <clears throat> Thomas was down bad when the disciples came to him. Doubt's a really big word. Doubt's a really big word. The disciples were hiding in fear of being killed. Thomas was hiding in doubt that he was following something that wasn't true. He was afraid of his entire life crumbling down around him. He's away because he feels defeated. Verse 24 and 25, they sound like my friends that I've talked to in the past, people I've counseled and talk to, who are at the end of their rope, who just don't know where to go. Thomas doesn't know where to go. Thomas is done. He's doubting what happened with Jesus. He said, unless I have the concrete evidence, unless I get to touch him, I'm not believing. I'm done. I've been done before. I know a lot of people who have been done before. I think this is a doubt that most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we've asked these same questions. Like I said, I live in doubt. I know I've asked the same questions that Thomas asked. I've asked if Jesus really came back from the grave, if he's still really alive. And we can go back a couple months ago and take a look at the core claims series we talked about and a lot of the evidence for it. But oftentimes, our doubts don't want evidence. Our doubts want to run toward you know, the other direction. They don't want to look at the pile of evidence we have. They want, to, they want to go in the opposite direction. And that's why Jesus comes to Thomas and meets him in his doubt. Jesus probably wasn't ecstatic about it. Jesus probably wasn't happy that Thomas was doubting. He even says that blessed are those who don't see and believe. But what Jesus doesn't do is he doesn't get angry. Jesus doesn't condemn Thomas. He's not frustrated with Thomas. He says, look here, touch. If this is what you need, I'll provide it. If you need to touch my wounds, touch my wounds. It's me. I'm Jesus, the same Jesus that walked with you for three years. Trust me. Trust me. The trust isn't broken. I did exactly as I said. How much do you wish that Jesus would do that for us, right? That he would just appear, tell me to get off the stage and be like, hey guys, look at these cool holes in my hands. I did that for you all. Because that's often what we want. We want the concrete evidence. We want proof with our eyes, but that's not faith. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. There 
has always been and always will be a mystery about faith and about God. Now, don't hear me say that there is no proof for God, because like I said, there's ample proof. But our doubts don't care about the proof. Our doubts want to sit in here, and they want to fester. They want to sit there and tell us that it's not real, that there aren't questions to be answered. And I know you have doubts, because I've had doubts. I know everybody asks these questions. But then we come into church and we go, well, this is church, and we're supposed to believe in Jesus here. Are we really allowed to ask that question here? Am I really allowed to ask if, like, God's real and if Jesus rose from the dead? Because I'm, I'm unsure about what this religion is actually about. And some of us have been in our faith for a long time, but those questions still crop up every now and then. And we go, is this actually a place where I can voice my fears? Because when we walk into church and we have doubts about the resurrection of Jesus Christ or what it means to follow Jesus, the word doubt becomes a really big word becomes a really big word. It's backloaded with fear, feelings of loneliness, anxiety of how people are going to look at us when we ask questions. We're wondering if we're allowed to even ask those questions here, but let me tell you what, church is the best place to ask those questions. The story, the conversation that Jesus and Thomas had, it's looking at us as a whole church, and it's saying, hey, this needs to be a place where people can voice their doubts, where people can come and ask questions when they're in their dark places because of an illness that's taken over, or something's gone wrong in life, or they've gotten fired, or school's gotten really hard, they need to be able to ask, what happens in faith? What happens with Jesus? Why do we talk the way we talk? When doubt creeps in, church is the best place to be able to voice those doubts. Jesus met Thomas in his doubt and helped him along the way. His friends reached out to him when he was struggling and brought him back in. They went and found Thomas and helped him along the path. The cove needs to be a place that helps people along the path when they have questions. To answer questions about faith, about salvation, about a relationship with Jesus. And if you have questions about any of that, you can come down front. I'll be right in that front row here in a second. You can ask anything. Love answering questions. You can find someone with a name tag. That means they're staff or elders. They'll talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. You can email us, text us. Call us, just Google Swiss Cove Christian Church. All our information pops up there. We want it to be easy for you all to be able to contact us. As a church, it's making sure we're a safe place for people to ask those questions. And if you're a non-Christian, the story with Thomas is saying, hey, ask the question. Come forward with the doubt. When, When asked about it, Thomas said, I don't believe, and here's why. Here's why. Unless I touch the holes in his hands, unless these questions are answered, I'm out. Ask the questions. It's easy to continue in doubt and hold stuff inside because we're really good as humans at holding stuff inside. We don't like to come forward with it. But unless we come forward with it, it's not going to get talked about and it's not going to get answered. It's best addressed through conversation. So as a non-Christian, we're encouraging you, find people who can help you through your doubt. Find someone that can help you through your doubt. And the same applies as a Christian. Find someone who can help you through your questions. Because we all have them. We act like in church everything's hunky-dory. You go around, ask anybody, hey, how are you doing today? They're going to say good. They're not going to ask anything. Man, if you've got a question, ask it. If you've got a doubt, address it. And then if you're a Christian and, you know, you're not really doubting anything, this story is telling us something else we can do with it. Notice what Jesus and the disciples did when Thomas was, was off. They addressed Thomas directly. They went after him. They didn't leave Thomas alone to wander around and live in his doubt. They went and got him. When your friends are struggling and you know they're struggling, when they've got questions, when they're, when they're struggling to, to figure out what Christianity is all about, go be with them. Go find them. Go talk to them. And notice that the disciples didn't do it in a way where the friends walked away. Thomas was still hanging out with the boys. Be a place where people can hang out, can talk, can be open in conversation. But don't let them live their life alone. What do we say all the time here? We're in this together. Man, be together with people. You can't be together with people if you isolate people. It's impossible to be alone and be together at the same time. So make sure you're together with people. Because it's so easy to get caught up, and we get caught up all the time in the busyness of life. It's so easy to not see people. 
It's so easy to take our own doubts and shove them down, shove our own fears down and hide them and not tell anybody. But we want to be a place at the Cove where we love people, where we pray with people, where we walk together with people in moments, whether they're dark moments, happy moments, whatever questions they might have. I got to talk to a family about dinosaurs this week, so I'm saying from dinosaurs to Jesus, man, the Cove needs to be a place where we want to talk to people about whatever questions they might have. If you need help growing closer to Jesus or have any questions about faith, what he can do for your life or who he is, come ask. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today and just the ability to come to you with anything, that you make a world that's uh, discoverable and open and allows us to ask questions and, and find out about you. Help us to have the confidence that Uh, the people in this room have our back, that they want to answer our questions and help us to be a church that faces doubt and doesn't leave people alone. We love you, Lord, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.